Okay. Well, we're at 7.05 and it might be a good time to get started. Um, people who join in can catch uh, the conversation as it's uh, happening, but the IFSC 2022 International Compost Awareness Week planning team wants to welcome you to this pre-recorded Illinois Farmer panel discussion. And as is the nature of spring and farming, we decided as a team to squeeze in this session with our experts while they were all available and mother nature was a bit calmer or gentler on their operations. Please enjoy and feel free to add any additional comments in the chat. IFSC member Jenny Futterman, as well as Chair IFSC Board of Director Chair Benjamin Crumstock will be compiling them and we will be doing our best to get your questions answered. Thank you for attending tonight. And please, if you do have questions, try to address uh, the question towards a farmer if it's in particular to a specific part of the conversation. Thank you. Welcome to the International Compost Awareness Week Farmers Panel, brought to you by the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition. My name is Teresa Johnston. I'm a senior environmental soil scientist at the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. My role is outreach and research, primarily looking at use of biosolids and compost in Cook County and how it can improve soil health, sequester carbon, and improve degraded urban soils. I will be hosting the event along with Bana Heinsen. Bana, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Teresa. Uh, my name is Bana Heinsen. I work for the Cook County Farm Bureau and my role is primarily working with elected officials and then adult consumer education. Um, also my farmer and my husband and I are farmers in Northern Illinois. A portion of our land is certified organic and a portion of it is also conventional. So it is a pleasure to be here with you. And I'm very excited to be kicking this off. And I'm gonna ask each of our farmer panelists to provide a brief introduction about yourself and then also about your operation. And we're gonna go in the order that I'm seeing you. So Jeff, if you could start. Hi, my name is Jeff Miller. My wife, Jen, and I uh, run Prairie Wind Family Farm in Grays Lake, Illinois, in sort of the northeast corner of the state. Um, our main business is a CSA. Um, we also have a farm stand here on site at our farm. That's the main ways that we market um, our produce. We're a mixed vegetable farm, um, all certified organic. Um, and we've been farming here for uh, about 16 years, a little over 16 years. Um, our relationship with compost is we've used it in very different ways over the years. We started out uh, very heavy. We made our own compost for a while. We treated it as manure. It wasn't fully composted. Um, and so we always applied it in the fall. Um, over the years, we've kind of backed off a little bit and applied a little more judiciously, I guess, not quite as heavy as we were. We were starting to notice our soils kind of getting out of balance by putting down too much for a little while. Um, so historically we put it on in the fall. Now we've been buying compost in when we feel like we need it. And um, that's given us a lot more flexibility to be able to put it down kind of when and where and how we need it. Um, right now, our main use of compost is in very specific spots in our fields where we think the field or the crop might benefit from it. And then also in uh, hoop houses, um, we see a benefit there too. Wonderful, thank you, Jeff. Carl? My name is Carl Smits. Uh, my wife and I and our family farm on, in far southeast Cook County. So as far southeast as you can go, that's where we're at. We're right on the state line. Uh, our main business is a greenhouse operation. We also have a mixed vegetable and herb operation. We market those mostly in the city of Chicago at farmers markets. And we also have farm stands on the farms down south here. We have been using compost for, well, 
I have to qualify that statement. Compost is probably not the exact terminology. We use organic matter uh, and have been using that for the past 32 years. We started back when the yard waste ban went into effect in Illinois uh, back in July 1 of 1990. And we've been using yard waste on our farm uh, since 1990. And what we do is we take it in from landscapers, municipalities, um, uh, uh, garbage haulers as well. We grind that up and we uh, static pile, windrow that and then we spread that on the farm in the fall. Uh, we can't be certified organic because we take in yard waste. And so we would like to be, but we can't. The organics board says we, since we take in yard waste where people may have sprayed chemicals on their farm or yards, um, we are not able to be certified. The irony in that is we had the grass tested, we had the yard waste tested and there's no residue in there that can be found. So. We just have to live with the organics board decision, but we've been using it successfully on our farm building up soils for the past 32 years. Wonderful. Thank you, Carl. Um, Kyan. Hi, um, I run, own and operate the table farmer workshop. We're in central Illinois. Um, I'm a beginning farmer. Um, we've only been doing this for a couple of years, but we use compost anywhere and everywhere. Uh, my farm is primarily a CSA based farm. We also uh, sell at a couple of the local farmers markets and we have an on farm um, farm stand farm store set up as well uh, for additional sales. We do in addition to the, the CSA vegetables. We also have some some fruit production. We have cut flower production and we rotationally graze pasture raised uh, egg laying hens, ducks, geese, and later this year we're adding some hogs as well, which I'm pretty excited about. Uh, we use compost anywhere and everywhere, um, but it's almost exclusively plant based compost. Uh, I use the deep compost mulch system for my growing beds, permanent raised beds, and we have to buy that amount in to set up our beds for um, the first time we set them up. After that, though, we do produce our own on farm compost that we use for top dressing, fertility re, um, inputs as well. Um, I believe my compost that I produce is more biologically active than anything I've been able to find commercially produced. Um, and that's kind of what I focus on with my compost is to make sure it's full of life. Um, I also use compost in um, a little bit of my seed starting systems. We do buy a compost based potting soil for seed starts, uh, the Vermont compost companies uh, for vmix. And then when we're potting up for our larger size pots, we do add some of our compost in addition to the potting soil to help um, give it a more well-rounded uh, mix. Wonderful, thank you. Jason. Hello, my name is Jason Holm. I'm the farm manager at Green Earth Harvest. Uh, out in Naperville, Illinois, so about 40 miles west of Chicago. Um, we're a program of the Conservation Not Foundation, a large nonprofit that focuses on conservation throughout northeastern Illinois. But our farm is centered on the 60 acre property here in Naperville. We're an organic mixed vegetable operation um, on on the 60 acre property just in the middle of suburbia and we actually get um the city of naperville leaves from the city of naperville uh every year and we last year we got like three thousand cubic yards brought in for free which is just this incredible source of fertility um that's really the main thing that we use that we compost or let break down like jeff said we treat ours as manure in terms of like timing. So we do it either in, usually in the late fall, sometimes in the very early spring. We also will, uh, depending on the year and availability, get uh, horse manure from a nearby horse farm. Um, and then in the past we have purchased uh, finished compost and laid it down in like our greenhouses um, right before planting. We don't do that as much anymore just because we didn't feel like it was making it an incredible difference, but we probably will start to do that maybe once a year instead of twice a year. But 
um, those leaves, we, we really try to spread out on a lot of the farm and they, they do great. Uh, we also use those as mulch. Um, and then anything that we don't use, we'll let sit and break down further. So we have leaves from um, 2020 still breaking down on the farm. Um, just putting it all into a big wind row savings account. I love the visual of a wind row savings account, not gonna lie. Um, thank you, Jason. Kevin. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Kevin Erickson coming from Loyola University of Chicago. Uh, we have a fairly small agricultural operation. It's mainly used for training students. Um, that includes about 75 students a year, um, which is a lot of students for a pretty small amount of acreage that we operate. Uh, so we have more than enough labor uh, to take care of our labor needs, uh, but our program is pretty diversified. So it includes mushroom production, uh, hydroponics, aquaponics, outdoor production, indoor production, and, and those ways that I just mentioned. Um, and then we also host a farmer's market on campus for the, for the local community. So um, most of our food is sold at the farmer's market. We also sell to a few restaurants outside of the farmer's market season. So we're mainly urban or we're all urban and we're a pretty small scale operation, uh, but compost is pretty important. We have compost uh, collection and pickup all over our campus, including in all the dorm rooms. So there's a whole bucket system. Uh, but as far as using it in production, um, we do collect a lot of our own scraps and organic waste from our lab. Um, as well as what we generate on site. We have all of our own compost bins that we manage throughout the year. Um, and we only added compost initially when we started the garden with raised beds. And um, since then we haven't had, you know, large loads of compost coming in. So we probably generate enough to put a half inch side dressing on our beds, usually occurring late spring or summer when we're getting to screening the material from the fall before. So we make sure it's really broken down and uh, very stable temperature wise before we're adding it. Um, so it's all used in field production. And, and then similar to uh, what Jason just mentioned, all of the leaves on campus are now collected by the landscaping crew and dropped off at our urban farm site. So it enables us to not only have um, a really good carbon source for browns and in, in our um, compost bins, but it also is used to cover the beds if we're not able to cover crop them. So our goal is to have about two thirds of our beds cover crop starting in August and September, usually under sowing under main summer crops. And then we will usually have a, a one third of the beds go late into the year and those will get covered with leaves over the winter. So there's some sort of protection. And then our our goal is to have two of in a three year process, two years are cover cropped and at least one of those would be with leaf coverage going through the winter. So um, compost is really important, especially it's not uh, because it's expensive to haul it into the city. And, um, you know, we don't have a huge amount of like straw, for example, is a really hard resource to get for someone in an urban environment. Um, so just using our own inputs um, as much as we can is, has been really helpful. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so to start our conversation, I appreciate everyone's introduction and learning a little bit more about everyone and your businesses. But I want to kick off our conversation and ask you, what does the term regenerative agriculture mean to you? And is it one of your goals that you're doing in your operation? That's a great question. Um, I can probably take a stab at that one. Um, I think regenerative agriculture to me sort of builds on the sustainable agriculture framework or the NOP framework that's been around. And I think largely what often gets discussed is building is building soil organic carbon. So the basic idea being that we're withdrawing less carbon than we're putting into the ground. Um, in a really small space intensive environment, that can also be um, challenging to do when you have a lot of, uh, when you're sort of maximizing production in small spaces, having really tight turnover. 
Um, but limiting um, carbon loss could be things like not tilling. We use broad forks <clears throat> for our beds, um, making sure to cover soil, no bare expo exposed soil at any time um, is also important. And then sort of moving beyond or you know, soil carbon, I think the regenerative movement is also capturing things like labor practices um, that have not been addressed in the standard NOP language um, over the past decades. There's some uh, language on livestock that has also been an improvement. And I'm also referencing uh, the regenerative pilot program that was rolled out, <clears throat> excuse me, a few years ago. So I think those would be really strong elements. And I, I've also read um, materials that were suggesting that regenerative agriculture is something that benefits both the environment and the social aspect. And so I think that social aspect is one that's not often talked about within this framework, but it's one that we emphasize as well, including you know sound labor practices, um, the right to collective bargaining, as well as equity and access and, and distribution of where our food goes and who gets it. Um, so I think that all of those are really important sort of ways to define regenerative agriculture, although I think we can all argue it's, it can be somewhat of a slippery term with different definitions. So I'd be very interested to hear what other people think too. Thanks, Thank Kevin. That was a great answer, um, incorporating that concept of um, people, profit, and planet in a, in a different way that I've, um, than I've heard previously. Jason, I know you said you're part of the Conservation Foundation. Um, is that one of the goals for that foundation? Um, it's kind of interesting. So Green Earth was actually a separate nonprofit until four years ago in 2018. And so we are fair, it's a fairly recent merger and it's, it's a really interesting one. Um, but it, it's the Conservation Foundation's first kind of for TCF or the Conservation Foundation previously had worked with farmers selling their land to buy it up, get it to a forest preserve district pretty much. And so this is the first foray for TCF into agriculture as like an active thing rather than a, oh, we'll take, you know, we'll try to grab that land, buy that land up and make sure it's not developed, which is, you know, great. But I think that a part of maybe regenerative agriculture in general is having skilled practitioners of it. Um, and you can't really do that if it's just like, you know, when farmland is used up, we just buy it and put it in the forest preserve. It's really great to have an example of like a farm in the suburbs in a very much non-farming community. Um, that's an example of, I think doing the doing things the way they should be done. Um, this kind of touches on like Kevin's uh, Kevin's points about the like social side of regenerative farming or farming as like a viable career for people. Um, but it is very much like I think we realize now that conservation and agriculture are linked, either for better or for worse whether that's um, organic practices, uh, regenerative practices. Um, yeah, conservation and agriculture are just like linked and that that's a fact for sure. Jason, later in our conversation, I really wanna to touch on your location and being so close in that urban area. Um, when we kind of talk about what you wish the general public knew about farming. But before we go there, um, I really wanted to touch back the table and farm and workshop, I believe has rotational grazing. And that is part of regenerative agriculture. And I just wanted to touch on that and see if you can kind of explain for the people who may not be as aware of what you're doing. Yeah, uh, regenerative ag is a key component of what we do. Um, we're a small farm, and I think size is an advantage for us in that. It's really hard to take a huge acreage and make that regenerative because there's just so much um, slop, if you will, on the margin. 
Uh, my farm only has four and a half acres and pretty much every single inch of that acreage gets put into production, whether it's actually producing something for us or being put into some kind of system that will help benefit the whole ecosystem as a whole. Um, to that end, that's why we have birds on our property. That's why we have animals on our property. We want to bring the biology and the uh, systems, the, the benefits of those animals into our system. So um, to answer your question, rotational grazing means that my animals never stay in one spot for more than a couple of days. Um, it mimics what you see in nature, where, uh, for example, I often use the examples of the herds in Africa, the, the wildebeest and the zebras. Uh, something is always moving the herd on. Most people think it's that they run out of food, but it's actually the predators. The predators, the lions, the, coy uh, the lions and the hyenas, whatnot, they come behind the herds, they push the herds. Uh, so we mimic that system. Um, we use electric netting as our predator. And so when, when in, in, the, in the natural system, there's a huge disturbance with all of these animals grazing one area um, and then also uh, leaving their droppings behind, which is a ton of nutrient. It's oftentimes too much nutrient for that land to handle if they were to stay too long. But then the predators come through and push them on to new land. And so the land goes to this incredible disturbance period followed by an incredible rest period. And it's a much longer rest period before the herds migrate back through again. Um, so what we've done is, you know, we didn't come up with this, we just learned this. We have a rotational grazing system for our poultry that incorporates nine 50 foot by 50 foot squares that are adjacent to each other. The birds spend a minimum of four days, but no more than five or six days in a single square. Um, they will, like we just moved them yesterday. Um, even after five, six days, there's still plenty of grass. However, if it rains, the ducks get to have a heyday. They, they love the water and they start digging holes everywhere. So every three to four days is our target to move them on. And with nine squares at a four day rotation, it takes 36 days to go through the whole, the whole thing. The pest cycle for, for poultry is broken after 27 days. None of the pests that would harm my birds can survive outside of a host for 27 days. So by giving each section of the pasture a minimum of 27 to 36 days of rest, I don't have to worry about um, the disease pressure hitting my flock as much. In addition to that, by rotating them through, we're building topsoil actively on the farm. Uh, we're extending the grazing period of our land uh, because of how grass grows it grows in an s curve pattern um, and that's what i want to add the hogs into ahead of the birds uh, so we noticed that the chickens don't eat grass as much they eat bugs and they eat seeds but they don't really eat the grass and so we ended up having to mow ahead of them sometimes when it gets too long and so we want to bring an herbivore in uh, that'll help trample all that grass eat that grass I don't have enough land for cows um, and sheep don't make sense to me. I don't get it. Um, so we're gonna try a Idaho pastured pig breed, which is supposedly supposed to eat grass and uh, we'll see how that goes. So um, yeah, the, the electric fence mimics the predator and by mimicking nature with these periods of chaos and disturbance followed by periods of rest, we're able to actively build topsoil. That's how the topsoil in Illinois was built um, with the bison herds. Thanks, Kai, and that was a really interesting answer. Uh, did Jeff or Carl want to contribute to the definition of soil regeneration or regeneration in agriculture? So just I'll be real brief here. I think for years, farmers uh, commercially and otherwise um, have been taking from the soil and haven't been putting back. And so what, uh, even to Jason's point where he says farms are being used and then the forest preserve buys them up and puts them into forest. Um, that's one way to regenerate. But another way to regenerate is to understand that that's happening and then add organic matter back. And you're going to have to add organic matter back in a larger quantity than you've been taking uh, out because for years we've been making withdrawals but making no deposits. 
Uh, we've been plowing all of our ground. We've been working all of our ground, keeping it bare, exposing to the wind, rain, and, and, uh, and other elements. And the only way to build that soil organic batter back up is to add organic matter back. Um, I think we're all talking the same, same language. We're all on the same page here. It's just how we get there is, is, is different. But uh, you have to make more deposits and withdrawals if you want to regenerate your soil. Thank you. Um, Carl, you've been in farming for many years. Has soil regeneration been on your mind for all that time? I, it sounds like you've been doing regenerative methods all this time, but did you even think of it in that capacity for a while or um, was that something you transitioned to? Yeah, so Bon has heard the story a million times, so I'm not going to tell it here, but if you ever come to the farm, I'll tell it and it's in detail. Uh, but I did not go I'm a first generation farmer um, and my favorite class in college while I was going to school to be a minister was soil science. And one of the main things they taught in soil science was you have to build up your organic matter. How you do it is up to you, but you have to do that. And so when we started the farm, that was first and foremost on our mind is find a piece of ground. It doesn't matter what kind of ground you get. As long as you build it up with organic matter, you can farm anywhere. And so that was first and foremost on our mind. And we've been building up the soil uh, in Southeast Cook County, like I said, for 32 years. That's great. That actually leads to one of our more sciencey questions of how do you maintain organic matter on your farm? Uh, so I'll just quick jump in. I, we maintain it by actually adding more every year. Um, we do soil tests, so we have to we have to have some type of baseline to know where we're at. What what's our target? Um, and then we take in the grass and the leaves and the branches and the wood chips. We grind that all up and make a. It's it's not rocket science, but it is. Um, we try to get half carbon, half nitrogen, or half green, half brown, if you will. Um, that's our goal. We grind that up. And then we add it to the farm. And we know we're adding more than we are taking away because our organic matter uh, percentage is going up every year. Wonderful. Jeff, do you uh, try to add organic matter or maintain that organic matter at Prairie Wind? Yeah, I think uh, that that ties into the regenerative. And we've always tried to put back more in than we take out both, as uh, I think Kevin said, in terms of our community and our farm and the soils here. Um, and so, yeah, a lot like um, Carl said, we do soil tests to help us get a baseline and then try to build on that. And we actually see some of our fields that have been production the longest have the highest amount of organic matter than some of the newer fields that were have not been growing on as long, um, which to me shows that we're must be doing, you know, something uh, right in the fact that it's going up and we're still producing uh, quite a bit of vegetables out of those. Um, and we do that mainly uh, a little bit through compost. And then we've started a really strong effort with cover crop um, as a way to build soils and organic matter. And so we shoot to have at least 20% of our farm in a, more than a season long, almost a full year long cover crop. And then there's another 30% of the farm that's in sort of a shorter term cover crop kind of rotating through the farm with the vegetables and so hopefully most of the about half of the farm is in cover crop at any given time and that's been a really cost effective and uh, we see a lot of benefits to our soils through that in terms of the textures of the soils and how the crops coming out of them perform and everything yeah i just to piggyback off jeff's point like the compost is phenomenal um on a large scale, you know, on this 60 acre property, I think we have 30 or so, 30 or 35 acres of fields. And um, spreading com even free leaf compost takes a really long time to spread for us. Um, and so that in conjunction with, we use ours very similarly to how Kevin uses their, um, their leaves where we use it as kind of a mulch over winter for fields we can't cover crop, but we cover crop like as much as possible and that is um you know the you can use the properties of the soil to grow organic matter and then get it back you know plow it back into the soil which is cover crops are magical almost 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, so it sounds like a lot of you do composting, leaf mulching, cover cropping, which are all fantastic ways to get that organic matter into the soil and contribute to the regenerative agriculture. So moving forward, we're going to start with some more scientific and practical questions of uh, your soil health and your use of compost before we move into some of the more social and uh, policy related questions. So first of all, what is your baseline for soil health? Kevin, I know you have a lot of students working with you. Um, I don't know if you have sure. tests that you run. Maybe you have an answer for that. Yeah, so soil health um, pH is a big one for us. We have a, a climbing pH. It's usually pretty alkaline here. <clears throat> um, organic matter is also something that we um, keep track of, cation exchange capacity, which is also can be related to organic matter as well. Um, our soils, you know, really they are compost that we started with building the beds. And so our, our soils are probably between 15 and 20% organic matter at all times, which is probably higher than most agricultural field soils, I would imagine, uh, which anything over, I think 5% is usually pretty good. Um, we also have elevated potassium and phosphorus in our soil. And so it's important to make sure that anything that we're adding is not elevating phosphorus, particularly, which is much higher than our relative rate of potassium. So, uh, you know, and you know, our macronutrients are important. Um, I don't test usually for micronutrients. Um, you know, I've done initial metals testing, but using um, a lot of compost, you know, sort of religiously every year is really great for trace elements. I found it's really good for adding in a little bit of nitrogen usually to get you through one year, but sometimes you might need a little more. Um, yeah, I would say those are the basic soil health um, sort of quantification aspects. I mean, it's also important to look at your, your performance over the last year, you know, um, soils aren't changing that drastically from year to year. I mean, maybe you are withdrawing some nutrients uh, that are exchangeable, but you know, the, you, you're probably sort of seeing a story with your soil that develops over the years that, um, you know, sort of you can look for some things that you know how to adapt and, and change them slowly over time. But. Thank you. Does anyone have any other baselines that they measure um, aside from what Kevin mentioned. So I try not to get sucked too much into just looking at the mineral composition because that's only part of the equation, I think, uh, for soil health. Um, like I said, I'm a beginning farther, so I don't know um, a lot of the conventional wisdom for this, but um, everything that I'm reading, everything that I'm learning is also pointing just as much to the biology, if not more, to the biology and the soil food web. Um, and so when it comes to, you know, getting a soil test uh, to establish um, the health of your soil, if all the test looks at is the mineral composition, I don't think it's telling um, a full and complete story there. Um, and that's one of the, what I found, one of the benefits of using a lot of compost, because you're not only, if you've got a good compost source, you're bringing in a lot of that biology with the compost itself. Um, but even if it's not fully alive, the compost is such a great habitat for a lot, a lot of that soil biology to um, take up residence in. Um, so I think the minerals are really important. You have to know them. If you don't, if you don't have calcium, you're not going to have tomatoes, right? Um, but at the same time, if you don't have an active soil food web that's stable and functional, uh, I don't think your plants will access the calcium as easily as they need. Uh, so I think it's it's both and um, in regards to that. So um, I'm trying not to get sucked too far into the mineral side, but at the same time, finding it very hard to answer that question with what the what is what does healthy soil biology look like? I, I'm not sure yet. Um, I'll let you know when I find out. <laughs> Have you, is, are there any specific tests that you've done uh, to evaluate biology? Uh, I think what I'm learning is that I need to develop my farmers instinct and eyesight um 
learning to read the weeds um, because weeds for the most part uh, spawn and germinate in specific soil conditions. Um, learning to read my pests uh, because I believe, as I understand it, um, pests and disease function in the plant world the same way that predators function in the animal world. They pick off the weak and the old. Uh, so if you've got healthy soil that's producing healthy plants, uh, you won't have pest issues as much. Um, and so learning to read those as symptoms and, and diagnosing the problems that come from that, um, I think is what is needed most. Um, I will say that I've had only one test done on my soil so far, and it was exclusively mineral based. Uh, but then with that test, I did um, pay for a soil health consultation that looked at everything. Um, I just did it last week and it was awesome. So. I, th I think Kyan Kaya, is, is really onto something. Um, there's, there's the mineral side, which is really easy to quantify. I, every farmer can do it. But then there's that other side that isn't quite, you can't quite put your finger on. For example, water holding capacity. Um, is that going up? Um, but at the, on the other end of the spectrum is, can you work your ground sooner in the spring because your organic matter is up and you're not going to damage your ground by working it too wet? That's another way. Do you see a lot of worms? Um, that's another thing. Uh, when you put your hand into the ground and dig in, can you dig in with your hand or is it rock hard like concrete? I mean, there's, there's certain things that, sure, mineral side is very important, but the, the other side is very important as well. And so those are some other baselines that we use too. How's the ground look? Does it smell good? That's another thing. I love that you're both including a lot of things that aren't necessarily measured. Um, I mean, you certainly can measure water holding capacity, but you're not talking about it in a way that you're out there measuring it. You're actually just getting that feel for it. Uh, and I think that's a, a really um, authentic, description of this baseline of soil health that you have. Uh, does anyone else have anything that they have as a go-to for soil health? I would also add that, um, that uh, you know, part of our, uh, unlike our organic certification form, you know, you have to check the ways that you uh, monitor soil health and we do just, you know, visually and by feel and, and um, by soil tests every other year or so. But also, like you can really tell a lot by the yield. Um, on our farm, there's one field that actually has been farmed the longest under green earth management um, that is just like exceptional. And we can kind of tell that the soil health there is really high for a variety of more geographical or geological reasons. But you can, um, you know, are you getting? better yields year after year. And if with the same amount or less fertilizer, um, and if so, like you're probably managing for soil health pretty well. If you're getting worse yields or you're having to put on more fertilizer to get the same yields, eh, you should probably rethink what you're doing. Um, so that's kind of a, uh, a quick way to monitor it. Like soil health goes hand in hand with generally speaking. And I would add, in addition to yield, just how the plants look, a lot of times, we, even if we don't see it in the yield, we'll see it just in the visual aspect of the plant or of the soil. As somebody mentioned earlier, we focus a lot on the soil texture. And if we're seeing plants that look really green and healthy and, um, and that, and then soil that is really you know workable and fine and not really tight and seized, those are good indicators to us about if we're doing it right, or if we need to give fields uh, some time off to help them kind of recuperate after a long wet season or that sort of thing. Yeah, that's a really good point too. Um, also just measuring measuring sort of the biology was discussed and that's, that's something that's been really important to me and I've been looking at. So one is, you know, you can do, you can measure organic matter, which is often aligned with soil biology. Um, however, there's like Solvita CO2 burst test, which is measuring respiration, which is pretty useful. And then there's also microscope methods that 
Um, some folks have been able to look at soils under a microscope and quantify bacteria, fungi, you know, protozoa, ciliates, amoeba, nematodes, et cetera, and actually sort of create a picture of, of your soil food web based on sample counts. I can tell you anecdotally that that is a pretty difficult skill to develop over time, but I really like this discussion around looking at biological indicators outside of the chemical world that are also achievable and of a do-it-yourself sort of nature by farmers, rather than sending off a, a sample to a lab and getting an interpretation of the results largely based on a chemical approach. I would probably agree with other people uh, about that, yeah. Just kind of jumping off of that, um, I forgot to answer the question of like, how do you test that biology? There's a new product that I'm planning on buying as soon as I get the money uh, called the microbiometer. Um, it uses their cell phone it, to take a picture of, uh, of, a, of a soil solution and can tell you the bacterial and fungal counts and also give you a bacteria to fungal ratio in the field. Um, and so it's, it's handheld. I don't have to send my soils off and should be able to very quickly understand whether, whether what my bacterial and fungal counts are and also my bacterial and fungal ratio, which um, will be, as I understand it, indicative of where my soil is at and the evolution of soils between, you know, bare ground that sprouts weeds to uh, old growth forest um, because the fungal ratios kind of germinate, determine what germinates there. That's an interesting test. I, I haven't heard about that. Um... Is it just an app that you get? It's an actual, it, it's microbiometer. Um, it's a product. I've seen it demoed at several different things. Um, I just came across it in my research. Um, I believe it's microbiometer.com. I'm not positive on that. Um, but the, the kit itself, I want to say it comes with like 10 basic tests and it's like $130, $150 for those, for that kit. Um, and you can buy more of the more of the replacement tests as you use them, but it works on um, your soil. It also works on, for me, which is really um, advantageous, I can test my, my compost and I could know immediately whether or not I have a bacteria or fungal dominated compost, which influences how I make my compost teas and extracts. And it also works on your compost teas and extracts. So you know what you're putting down on your soil from that. So I'm excited to use it. And as soon as I get the money, I'll buy it. <laughs> Let us know how that goes. Um, does anyone have, that's one way to evaluate soil biota. Does anyone have any ways that they evaluate their organic matter? I know, Carl, you mentioned organic matter as one of your baselines. Um, how do you actually measure that? Well, uh, organic matter, if we want to get scientific, then we have the soil tested and then we just get a, a readout. Yeah, we have 7% organic matter or 5% or 1%, depending on the farm that we're we're on. Um, but there is that that abstract way when you know, you just know uh, whether you have enough or whether you, you're lacking or whether you and, and some have said we've we found out we have too much. There's just too much there. Um, and we do that just by being out in the field and, and working the ground and getting off the tractor and, and checking the ground out. That's I'd love to be more specific than that, but it, it's it's one of those things that you just know. Thank you. Bana, I'm gonna turn it over to you for the next set of questions. Absolutely, thank you, Teresa. Um, so still looking at compost, for those of you who are using compost or have used compost, what are the characteristics that are most important to you? kind of jump in here. Um, so compost is really confusing because it can mean a lot of different things and you should use it differently based on what it is. Um, and understanding that's really important. Uh, so for example, like, is it a plant-based compost? Is it a manure-based compost? Is it a biologically active compost? Is it, is, did it, is it just something that you bought from the store that was sitting in a plastic bag in the sun, which means it's been nuked, it's dead, right? Um, understanding what you're buying, what it came from, 
it really changes what you do with it. So um, I mentioned earlier, I use the deep compost mulch system for uh, growing in my raised beds. Um, a lot of people, when they hear that, they think it's about fertility, adding all this compost. It's really not. Um, it's about the mulch aspect of it. And you can happen to grow in this mulch. Um, and so if I were to set my beds up with compost that was from like a horse manure compost or a manure base of any kind, there's no way you could grow in that because it would just be fertility overload. Even if it's fully finished, it's just too much. Um, the phosphorus levels would be just crazy. But um, when you understand that it's a, you're looking for the mulch aspect of it, you're primarily looking for broken down organic matter that is weed free, which is sometimes is called compost, sometimes is not, depends on what you mean, right? Um, that 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 changes what I'm looking for and changes what I what I want from it. Um, but at the same time, when I go to top dress my beds, well, then I'm not looking for just straight organic matter. Then I want the biology. I want something that's biologically active, and I want fertility out of that. Um, so, what do, what characteristics are, are most important to me? It completely depends on what I'm using it for. If it's in my potting soils, then I want it to be a very finished very balanced, um, very neutral, not going to burn anything. If I'm using it for setting up beds, I want to make sure it's plant based and that it's fully finished and doesn't have hot spots. Um, if I'm using it for uh, compost teas or compost extracts, then I want all of the biology. I want it to be fully alive. So um, the characteristics I look for are different depending on what I'm doing with it. Thank you. Um, Kevin, during your introduction, you um, brought up when you started with compost and using it in the gardens and side dressing it. And then you kind of went into talking about um, when you used it. Um, so can you just kind of explain, explain your composting? Um, just to clarify, so are you talking about what's going in the compost pile? what your the compost type you're using and when are you using it oh sure well. so um at this point we're only using what we produce on site which is heavily based on leaf material woody biomass from perennials on our site and then a lot of fall cleanup of leafy mass um and a lot of just you know discarded plants um so we're mainly screening it. So what we are aiming to do is to fill all of our compost bins one by one. Um, I, I should also note, being that we're in an urban area, our compost uh, laws are a little bit different. And so we have to have enclosed bins. We can't have big open piles like out in rural areas, which are, you know, could be easier to manage. So our goal is to fill a bin and to cap it and then not touch it until it's completely done. Um, and, you know, once we start to see that it's, it's cooling down, we'll turn it a lot more and we'll try and, um, you know, sort of even out the material before we screen it. Uh, and then we add it as a, usually as a side dressing in late spring through summer. And then our goal is to sort of get rid of the compost that we created and empty the bins so that we can start filling them up um, in the summer and fall. So we always want to have a place that we can be composting and always want to have some compost that's ready to use. Um, another distinction is that um, it's really handy to use finely sifted compost um, if you're worried about germination with smaller seeds or harder to germinate crops. Like carrots is a classic example for us. Now, using the compost I say compost in air quotes because compost could mean a lot of things. If it has, if it's a large texture or particle size, it may not hold water really well at the surface where you're trying to germinate small seeds. And so what we do is we create a ultra fine uh, sifted mix that we just put on the top layer occasionally, um, especially if it's in a harder period to germinate seeds. You know, this time of year is a little bit easier, but as we move maybe into warmer periods or outside of optimal temperature zones, it really helps hold moisture around the seed um, and give it a nice, easy start. So that would probably be our, our main way of using it and what inputs are going into. 
Thank you. Um, did anyone else want to talk about the characteristics or their use of compost before we moved on a little bit? Okay. Um, so our next question, and really, um, I'm from a livestock background. So when I initially thought of compost, I immediately go towards animal manure. And I realized based on our conversations and everything that I'm learning here is that compost can include many things. So my question is, when you first encountered compost compared to today, how has your understanding of it changed over time? We used to think of it as a big uh, fertility source. And so we put, you know, put down a lot and use that as one of the main ways that we uh, applied fertility to the farm. Um, and I think I said earlier, we started to see that over time through soil tests and observations that the soil was getting out of balance. And so we backed off and that was, uh, like Jason said, we used to have access to a lot of municipal leaf waste and then access to a lot of common manure. And so it was kind of a generically 50-50 mix that was broken down over the course of a year. Um, and so we've sort of shifted away from that. And now we do really sort of strategic lighter applications. And I've started to think of it as less about fertility and more about, sometimes I refer to it like a probiotic. It's just kind of a, it's a boost to help get things moving a little faster. You know, we can do it with cover crop too, but it's a little bit of a slower process. Um, which is one of the reasons we like it in hoop houses because we can get in there. It's such a tight time frame in the hoop houses and they're always really full, but we can squeeze compost in where we can't always squeeze cover crop in. I'll piggyback off of Jeff. I think that when we first started, we as well were both uh, more concerned about fertility and it's less about fertility more and, and more about soil health and uh, building up the soil. Water holding capacity is big because on uh, several of our farms, we don't, we don't irrigate. And we've seen in times of drought stress that our crops um, are, are green and growing when the neighbor's crops are, are firing and uh, are looking pretty sick. So we're more on water holding capacity and soil tilth and health and less about um, fertility and that's kind of where we're at. My experience with compost came from a totally different starting point. Um, I said I was a beginning farmer before this I did something else. Um, I started with compost as a way to recycle and reduce waste. Um, we were living up in the suburbs of Chicago and I don't even know how I got onto it, but learned that you could take your kitchen scraps and your grass clippings and mixing greens and browns and started doing all that. And so I started composting as just a suburban homeowner. Um, and over the course of a year, trying to you know figure it out and learn, uh, we drastically reduced our waste. Um, we basically had like one bag of garbage going out per week. Um, between recycling our plastics and such and then also recycling anything organic um, through our compost system and so um, did that for a couple of years and then when I decided to change careers and start the start farming instead it was just kind of a a natural transition to continue using compost um, went through some pretty serious growing pains figuring out how to scale up from you know a 16th of an acre home and just farm scraps to five acres of material trying to get the balance and everything right um, to actually produce compost. But um, yeah, for us, it started with a, a way of recycling and being more environmentally conscious as just uh, homeowners. Wonderful. And that's actually a great transition into my next question. Where did you learn your strategies for using compost? Mine might be the most boring. I, um, a lot of the strategies were just in, as a farm manager rather than a farm owner. You know, I didn't really get the chance to build systems from scratch. And I've only been managing the farm. This will be my third season managing the farm, but I worked here for five, five, yeah, I think five years before this. Um, and so a lot of the systems are inherited, like 
we were getting a little bit of horse manure before we were getting tons of leaves before um we were doing a good amount of cover cropping but i'm it, i've heard people say that you're a beginning farmer for like the first 10 years and that's like it, it's really at least those first 10 years um and i'm still i'm just now beginning to really think about like what is the best way to customize this um soil health program and this compost program and what other sources of organic matter can I get from my community for free? Um, so mine is bo mine are boring. I learned it from other people and I'm gonna see if I can improve on it, but I'm not sure. They were doing a pretty good job. Well, uh, I'll jump in for one second. I learned mine at the School of Hard Knocks. Um, a lot of trial and a lot of error. Um, but what we've done is we've come up with a system that works um, and it's it's sustainable and it's scalable. And uh, yeah, we've been using it ever since. But there was a lot of very, very hard times getting uh, getting the system down. Yeah, we, like Jason said, learned only, mostly from other farms. We started more recently trying to find, you know, consultants or, you know, I guess you call them experts, but people who are really focused on different areas to get into a little bit more nuance. But at the core, it was visiting other farms and talking to other farmers and watching what they were doing and taking that and kind of figuring out how to work it on our farm. I primarily learned from YouTube on how to compost. I giggle because that is my husband's favorite source as well. He loves that. Anybody else? I started on a larger uh, scale farm operation with Windrose, and we had also had an agreement with um, a mushroom company to get all of their waste substrate and that. So I have like fond memory, maybe not fond memories, but spreading mushroom compost with like a bandana, so I'm not inhaling it all, you know, like all day long, uh, or picking off mushrooms off of the, the spent substrate pile that they would deliver. Um, but um, probably within the last 10 years, I've started to think of compost as a crop, as an, as an output, as not, and I'll be perfectly honest in admitting that prior to that moment, I, I saw compost more as a place to put landscape waste in a way that could neatly break it down and sort of keep your farm tidy. I didn't always see the value in compost itself, fertility or otherwise, but also my background is using soils that already have a lot of compost. But it wasn't until I started thinking of compost as a as an outcome <laughs> as a crop not just okay, a way to manage meeting. waste that can be measured and um hearing i heard a talk by john jevons um speak about cold composting which i had i was sort of new to that idea and sort of the the i the ratios that i always have running in my head are 30 to 1 uh for hot for hot composting and 60 to 1 for cold composting um, which is different when you're adding on the materials versus when it finishes. Um, but I think this idea of, you know, um, reducing uh, ammonia off-gassing and, and sort of capturing nitro total nitrogen um, through this cold composting method also seems to have a lot of interesting benefits, but it takes a lot longer to actually do. And it doesn't necessarily kill uh, weed seeds because you're not getting up to really high temps. Um, like a hot compost. Kevin, we uh, on the farm, I found this book this winter. And it, you know, it's like an old school book from, you know, the 80s or something, 80s or maybe early 90s, early days, kind of the National Organic Program being formulated. And um, it was a book about composting, and I was reading it, and I realized the book was actually about how a farmer could start a compost business like making compost and then selling it, which I had never really like thought of before. And it was, you know, it's talking about like all the economics of it, but really talking about compost as, as a crop, as a valuable output. Well, 
Wonderful. Um, as you look at using compost, what has been your biggest obstacles and what has been most challenging about integrating them into your um, farm? For us, it's really expensive to put down. That's the biggest obstacle. It's a big, you know, it requires multiple tractors and a lot of time back and forth wherever the compost is located. And, um, and then it just, it's a slow process to actually get it down. It's heavy loads. So you have to be really careful for us anyway, how wet the fields are, to not do more damage than we're uh, doing good. So it's just, it's a really challenge, uh, expensive process to get it down. Yeah. Uh, it really expensive for us in terms of time well in terms of compost that we buy from other places it's very expensive in, in money and then compost that we produce very expensive in terms of time like jeff mentioned for our setup too it takes two tractors um running all day that's a lot of diesel fuel and then if this might not be quite the exact figure but like if we're running just like really efficiently really smoothly i think we could can maybe get five acres done um, at the at the rate of application that we lay down on the on the fields in the fall. We can get maybe five acres done in a day. So it takes yeah, it takes a long time. For me, yeah, it's like, expensive. Oh, go ahead. Okay, for me, go ahead. I, I've said before, like we're a small farm, uh, so we're actually not tractor based, um, and so I don't have the expense of running the, the vehicles for all day. My biggest challenge has been finding it. Um, there are not many people that are producing compost for sale. And then the where I got hit with an expense was delivery. Um, I had to go to, so I'm in Bloomington, the closest place that I could find uh, compost that I thought was good enough to use on our farm was champagne. Um, and so I pay almost as much for delivery as I do for the actual compost itself. That's just real quick. That's why we've started to move away from horse manure is the horse manure is free. The horse farm is like stoked to give it away, have a place to get it. But like, yeah, to rent a truck and we, we don't have our, one of us might have to just go and get a CDL license, but even then renting the actual truck is far more expensive than the actual compost or the actual manure. Yeah, I think one of the common threads you hear is expensive. Um, it's labor intensive. And then the other one is it's it's just weather related. You can you should only put it on when your ground is is able to support the weight of a tractor. Otherwise, you do more damage than uh, you're doing good. So those factors are the biggest ones for us. Wonderful. Thank you. We're going to transition just briefly back to um, regenerative agriculture. And each of you spoke about it at the beginning. And I was just wondering, um, we talked a little bit about obstacles with composting. We talked about where you learned about it and everything. Same thing with regenerative agriculture. Is there adequate information on regenerative agriculture available? If not, what needs to be changed? That's a good question. Um, I think the soil or soil or um, measuring carbon in soil is is not an easy endeavor as it, probably anyone who looks into this as there are ebbs and flows in organic carbon and <clears throat> excuse me I think <clears throat> the baseline idea of saying yes I'm sequestering carbon in my soil is not easy to prove uh, you can't take one static test and say I have more carbon in my soil or organic matter maybe organic matter being different, but I have more carbon in my soil than last year is not a, a statement that would lead to a conclusion that you actually did it because um, you are basically um, producing carbon, more carbon than using it in a relatively short part of the season. Um, so I think that's been a big sort of eye opener for me is in, in maybe other small scale producers who are really maximizing um, you know, production is that 
we may be carbon sources more than carbon sinks and supporting conservation and carbon sequestration outside of the farm you know, the idea that was mentioned of turning old farmland into forest preserves i think the agricultural world not only needs to present solutions that are economical for farmers but i think the agricultural world needs to support uh, climate change mitigation, carbon sequestration in other ways, even outside of agriculture. And for me in Chicago, you know, uh, urban agriculture folks should be partnering with conservationists uh, because it's all really related into one. And, and I'm not really buying into the idea that I am saving the world in my small urban organic plot um, because you know, largely agriculture is where carbon goes to be, you, you know, removed from the ground or off gassed. Um, and so I just think we need to sort of stop lying to ourselves. And maybe this is just a, my own perspective and saying that we're all sequestering carbon and we're all doing great things to mitigate climate change when it's not even measured. Um, and most of us have a, have a, a sort of a rough idea of that. So the solution, I think, to sort of address this is should be based on practice approaches. Um, you know, maybe a point system that's more weighted towards certain approaches than others. Uh, but simply going by soil analysis uh, may not be the strongest metric in proving um, if we're talking about carbon sequestration, which I, I think is sort of the big million dollar question in agriculture. Uh, if we're talking about improving um, soil or improving the world around us or mitigating climate change. Yeah, I, I uh, strongly agree with that. Like regenerative, regenerative agriculture is so important um, in a lot of senses of the word. And I don't think you hear farmers really talking about how farms can sequester carbon and save the world from climate change. But then you watch certain documentaries that are out there and it's like, the idea that like just doing similar farming that we've always done, but with a little bit different inputs and uh, slightly different practices, but with the same social and economic structure is going to somehow save the world from climate change is just at least overnight, just not true. Um, that isn't to say that like regenerative agriculture isn't important. It's just not the only thing that's important on that particular problem. Um, and once we like get past that promise, then I think we can see all the promises of regenerative agriculture and it's tying people into a local community and it's building soil health and it's building local biodiversity. And the benefits are so incredible, but they, it, you know, it's not the silver bullet to all that ails our society. Unfortunately, I mean, that would, That'd be easy, but that's just not the case. Um, but I, I think it regener regenerative agriculture is always tricky to say is, I mean, it's great. Like it, it really can fix a lot of issues and it really can bring people together and heal some of these gaping wounds in the earth. Um, as long as we realize that it's like not the only thing that's going to fix things for us. Yeah, I think there's a, also a big threat uh, in terms of greenwashing. And I feel like when I hear different people talk about it, a lot of people are bringing their perspectives to it. And so there's not always a consistent viewpoint on what it is, what it takes. Um, and I think going back to what Kevin said, the metrics and how are you, how are you showing that you are making the improvements that you know people are are claiming for it? Yeah, I think what Kevin said about actually measuring carbon sequesterization, like I don't know of any test that does that. And if we were able to actually say, yeah, last year I had X number of carbon, this year I had X number of carbon, and here's how I managed my land, that would be a huge tool in the toolkit of getting other people to be more regenerative in their practices. But right now we can't actually prove what we're saying about what we're doing. But you know the question of is there adequate information out there? Um, I think so. Um, that's why I did a career change. Um, but at the same time, I'm talking about very small scale 
farming. I'm not doing huge acreages. I'm not trying to support uh, a huge amount of staff. And, um, you know, when you're talking about scale, that's a completely different problem. Kind of, kind of like what um, Jason was saying, when you got scale involved, that's, it's not just regenerative. It's, there's an economy here. There's markets here. You have to um, take that into account. So for someone, for a smaller farm, it's easier for me to pivot things. And it's easier for me from the get-go to embrace practices, um, much easier than say a, a larger um, acreage farm is. Um, but for me, like, I think there's adequate information out there because it there's enough information out there that convinced me to completely do a, a huge career shift um, and jump into a whole new world. And everything that I do as far as my farming is built upon the information that I've learned about regenerative agricultural practices. Um, so like my farm is no tractor. We are no till. Um, we are a mixed farm intentionally to, uh, and we have pasture grazing. My understanding is that forests are great for uh, long-term storage of carbon, but if we wanna do active carbon sequesterization, the fastest way to do that is grasslands. Uh, grass has a much higher rate of carbon sequesterization, particularly when it's grazed. Um, so that's why I have a grazing operation on my small, small acreage. Um, so I, I think the information is out there. For me, the issue is not, is there adequate information out there? It's more, can you find it? Because it's not easy to find. And are you motivated to find it? Are you even aware that things need to change? Um, because like, I mean, I forget who mentioned it, but there's a couple of documentaries out there that are pretty powerful and poignant, but are they telling the whole thing? They're not farmers, you know? Um, so there's some really good points in there, um, but those are journalists talking and, and, and not farmers, so. So to follow up on that, what kind of support and information do you think a farmer would need to start exploring adding regenerative agriculture into their practices and so what would be beneficial to achieve these goals i'll jump in right so if, if we're talking about established farmers i think you can't start with regenerative farming i think you need to start with economics because you're talking about someone's livelihood you're talking about like hey you've done conventional farming for x number of years and you know we want you to completely stop everything that you're doing that your family is depending on like you have to start with economics you have to be able to say you're going to get this kind of return and it's going to uh take a couple of years but this is what you could possibly see uh, i think the when you're talking to established farmers you have to talk to real people about what real people care about in the short term yeah the long-term benefits are there and, and the long-term benefits for the community are there but if you're talking to a farmer talk to the farmer. It, it's not the farmer's fault that the system is set up the way it is on a national level, you know, or, or a global level for that matter. Um, so, yeah. I think solid examples would support the economic argument that having solid examples that a farmer can relate to and say, okay, I can see how this would work and put it into reality um, would be a helpful case as well. Yeah, it's, um, I feel like I, we've learned a lot from watching a lot of videos from much smaller farmers on kind of the practices that do, that they're doing on kind of a tractorless farm or, a, you know, maybe they only use a walk behind tractor, but it would be so cool to see more mid-sized, more large organic farms track to scale, um, either no-till or low-till or using lots of mulch. Um, really in search of some of those farms. Um, I, I think for existing farms, um, like someone said, like just speaking of the economics of it, having examples. And then for new farms, I think like, it's really hard to start a new farm as like many people here can attest, but like land access, um, making farm work, like a viable career choice for young farmers is like, um, both of those things I think are really important to the overall regenerative food system. I would add lease arrangements too, that having lease agreements that 
uh, encourage regenerative or require regenerative and sorting out. There's a lot of farming that happens on leased land and beginning to develop uh, lease arrangements that uh, encourage it and support it. That's a really big point. Cause like if you're leasing land, regenerative is a long-term investment, you know, like if you don't know you're going to have that land next year, like how much are you going to invest in it? So that's a, that's a really good point. One thing that might be a really good idea to have is some type of like farmer network where there'd be a network of people that are actually doing this and they could help mentor farmers that actually want to try it. I think if you um, are dealing with people who actually want to learn and want to try, it'd be easy to implement some of these things. If you're trying to force people to uh, to change their farming practices, there'd be a lot of a lot of pushback, I think. But to have some type of farmer network, I think it would be really helpful. Yeah, these are all great. Sounds ideas. like something you could have at the Farm Bureau. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Kevin. Oh sure. Um, I think all these ideas, and in, in in short, I think paying farmers to do conservation is it should be a priority. Um, and uh, what was the other point I was going to make? Um, I yes, learning from other people, as was noted, and I think taking a more regional approach with learning from other people, you know. Um, you know, like there are nuances that change with climate and with access to equipment. Uh, a good example is a project that you and I, Teresa, worked on a long time ago where we were trying to convince a farmer to use cover crops. I don't know if you remember this conversation happened many years ago. Um, and, you know, we sort of came in with the idea of why not use cover crops, but didn't really understand the technical aspect of of the machinery that would be required to under sow under mature corn or soybeans and if that equipment was even available and 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 so at that time the the best sort of option was aerial seeding by airplane into a mature cover crop and so i think there are regional solutions for regional problems and and to sort of echo what has been said I think farmers are more likely to try practices when they see it happening from someone that looks like them or has a similar setup as them or somebody they look up to rather than a random maybe YouTuber um, that they, it's harder to identify with. I, I think to go to a farm and see it in person is much more effective than probably reading it in books or hearing about it at a conference. Yeah, and I, I remember that project and even just that distance of going into McHenry County, which was a little bit farther northwest, their climate was just that much different that than we were in Cook County that those cover crops weren't able to get in early enough because of the earlier frost there. So, I mean, that regional specification was really critical. Okay, so I have one last question. What do you wish the general public knew about farmers and farming? I don't, it's not necessarily about farmers and farming. It's more about food production. Um, I wish the general public knew how food is produced in America, where food is produced in America. Um, and not just like the ins and outs of like, chemicals or not chemicals, organic or not chemical organic. The, the fact that the vast majority of vegetables are produced in a very small area of California that is heavily dependent upon irrigation from the Colorado River, which is now close to drought status, that jeopardizes an entire national food distribution system. Um, and, you know, there's all kinds of dominoes that fall because it comes from California, because it's mass produced, because it's machine handled machine picked because the tomatoes ripen on the trucks like when you find all these things out it it, it completely changes your understanding and it's like and for me that's that was part of what pushed me to, to do a career change is, is learning that this is a problem i didn't know it was a problem i, I went to the grocery store i like 
got some food and that was that. I, I had no idea how any of it was produced. I had no idea that the way it was produced was degrading the quality of the nutrition and that that was handed on to me as a as a someone who ate the produce. Um, and so when, when you you can't make a change if you don't know there's something wrong. And and so like I wish the general public was far more aware of where their food came from, how their food was grown, and how that changes everything uh, for for their consumption. Uh, it's it's there really is no comparison between a tomato that I can grow and sell in my town to a tomato that's mass produced in California. There's no comparison. It's, it's wrong to even call it a tomato. <laughs> like, it's just not, not even fair. I think kind of maybe in relationship to that, um, knowing knowing where things are growing and how they're growing and how that ties back to your local community in terms of the money staying in the community. And if we as farmers are doing the right thing, we're actually improving the environment on our farm, but in the environment surrounding us and improving the communities around us through access to food um and then additionally i think just how we treat and grow the soils in terms of this conversation and how much that impacts the what the food provides the eater in terms of health and other benefits i think one thing i want people to know is that farmers and i'd say all farmers we truly do care about the land we we're, we're not in it just for the money. We have to make money in order to survive, but we do care about the land. We care about our neighbors. Um, and like Kyan said is, we just want people to know where the food comes from. Um, if we don't grow the food, if there are no farmers, there is no food. It's as simple as that. Yeah, I would just add that I, I wish people understood that farming is is pretty hard to make a lot of money at unless you're growing cannabis these days. It's, um, you know, uh, I don't know any farmers that are making six figure profit, you know, in personal income and maybe uh, there are those out there, but um, it's, it's not, you know, uh, sort of a building wealth uh exercise or career often for a lot of people i mean owning land can be different in that scenario but it's you don't get necessarily get into it to get rich um i think another important aspect and is sort of you know who who is growing our food who who are farmers where are they coming from um the last time i checked more than 50 percent of the farmers in the united states were not born in america this uh, most of the folks growing and tending our food are um, undocumented non English speakers. Um, we have a, a sort of diversity within food production that is often not talked about. And building along this idea of knowing where your food comes from, I think we also need to understand who's growing our food and, and the importance of protecting their rights as Americans and as people that are really important to this economy. And so if you are truly uh, understanding, you know, our food system and who is growing it, you might have different views about undocumented people living in our country or ways that we deal with uh, them politically. Um, so just a thought there that may, may be a bit of a tangent, but an important one from my perspective. Well, it seems like the big take home message here is know your farmer. Um, and I'm proud to say that two of the farmers in this call have previously been my farmers. So I, I got CSA food from Green Earth Harvest a uh, few years and got food from the Loyola University Ag Program. So thank you to my farmers. Uh, even knowing what the practices were was helpful for me knowing I was getting high quality food. So, and Carl, I know you had mentioned that you cannot be certified organic, but that's one of those things. If the public knows your farming practices, it doesn't necessarily matter that you don't have that stamp on your food if they trust you and see the the high quality products that you're making and they know it's something that they can count on. Yeah, thanks for bringing Carl. 
Thanks for uh, bringing that. I'll just piggy one quick second is we're not able to be uh, organic, but we are Food Alliance certified and that fulfills one of our requirements for being on the farmer's markets, which basically it's, it's very similar. It's just without the organic stamp. Um, hey, Carl. Um, so my farm is actually certified naturally grown. Have you looked into that at all? Yep. Yep. Very much. Okay, so I really appreciate everyone being on the call today. You had a very thorough answer for many of these questions, and we get, got a lot of insights from all the things you provided as far as organic matter, soil health, your composting practices. So thank you for being here and participating. Bana, did you have anything you wanted to say? I just want to say thank you. Um, it has been a delightful conversation. Um, I, I think there is so much to take away from just different practices at different farms and even going back to that regional aspect. Um, on this conversation, we have farmers in different regions and I would truly appreciate you spending your time and I realize um, spring is here and everyone is ready to get into the fields and excited. So truly, thank you so much for spending time with us. You're welcome. Thank you. And thank you to our audience for attending. So that does conclude the panel for this evening. We want to thank every one of you for attending um, and participating in the chat this evening on behalf of the whole International Compost Awareness Week planning team. Thank you for coming and keep talking about compost. Uh, if you would like to have anyone register, please forward the link that was sent to you in the email, as well as um, provide any feedback um, via the email address, illinoiscompost.gmail.com. So thanks so much for coming. Good night. <laughs>